Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. I'm with you on page 22, 23, and following. We will be looking now at Isaac Bajavis Singer's text, The Wash Woman. The place we're going to begin really quickly is on page 23. And the literary analysis information, we are, put it in your notes, working with our very first text together in uh, Freshman English from our anthology. We're working with a narrative essay. Now let's write that term down and let's give an operational definition really quickly. We're looking at, first of all, this is huge, a non-fiction piece of writing. In other words, we're going to assume that what Singer is telling us from his childhood is something that actually happened. Okay, This was a real person with real events. Now, obviously, we can get into the debate about, well, do you think it's possible that he added some fictional types? Of, of course it's possible. But we'll go ahead and still qualify this as a nonfiction piece. We also are going to point out under literary analysis, again, this is a 2B observation, that we'll be paying attention to what we call main and subordinate characters. Now, that's simple. All we mean is we have main characters and then we have characters that are going to be minor or subordinate. About these characters, we're going to be asking about motivations. Why do they behave in the way they behave, these different characters? Okay. Now, in the reading skill, you'll notice that we are going to be working with making some predictions. In other words, what do we think is going on and going to happen in the text? On page, 30, uh, on page 24, we've got our guiding question. Can truth change? Okay, And we'll be looking at this as it relates to this text. The vocabulary is there listed for you on page 24. You definitely want to scan those words. If there are any of those words you've never heard of before, you want to write those words down and get an operational definition for yourself and then be looking for them, obviously, in the story. They will come up on the assessment, etc. All right? Now, on page 25, and again, your textbook always does this. We want to pay attention to it. Look with me on page 25. We're going to meet our author here, Isaac Bashevis Singer. We're going to begin with his dates. And we said this in our introductory lecture. Let's say it again. 1904 to 1991, that is a remarkable amount of time to live. Think about, just put it in your notes, all the stuff that this guy saw through his life. For example, if he's born in 1904, that means at the age of 10, that's when the First World War starts. He's 10 years old when the first, the Great War happens, and then the Second World War, and then all of the other conflicts of the 20th century, and then all of the amazing things that happened through the course of his life. Think about this. He was born in 1904, and he lived during a time when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. He was born in a time when everybody was horse and buggy. And then later in his life, he got to see somebody step on the moon. Jot down in your notes what an amazing life that had to have been. And of course, Singer is one of our greatest writers in large measure because of that perspective. Let's read a little bit about him on page 25. Storytelling always had an important place in Isaac Bashevis Singer's life. He grew up in the city of Warsaw in what is now Poland. Singer's rab father was a rabbi, a teacher of the Jewish faith and laws. Advice seekers streamed through the family home telling their stories as the fascinated young singer listened and observed. And then the next paragraph, life itself is a story. Fleeing persecution against Jews, Singer left Poland for New York City in 1935. We want that in our notes. He will leave Poland, 1935, of course, because of the uh, persecution, the Holocaust against the Jews in New York. Singer began to make a name for himself as a writer. He sent many of his tales in the world of European Jewry. He had left. Ironically, as he wrote, World War II devastated that world. Villages like the one of his birth were wiped off the face of the earth, even as Singer brought them to life on the page. And then finally, we're told that he does win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1978. The background information here is crucial. If we're going to connect new information to old information, we need some background information. So let's look at it on page 25, Jews in Poland. The Wash Woman, the text we'll be looking at, narrative essay, takes place in the early 20th century in what is now Poland. Centuries early, earlier, many Jewish people had settled there, drawn by the promise of religious tolerance. By Singer's time, Poland had been conquered by other countries. Yet, 
Poland's Jews held on to their traditions, continuing to speak Yiddish. Let's put that in our notes. Yiddish is a language blending German with Hebrew and even other languages. Okay, let's turn now to the text, Wash Woman. I'm on page 26, 27. Now, we're going to learn in this story about a woman who comes to the singer house and washes their clothes. That is her job. It's obviously not a big job in terms of, you know, going to make a lot of money or anything like that. And yet we're going to ask something about this woman. Notice you have an image there on page 26 that you can already begin to look at. Now our job here is to simply read along with our reader. The challenge is to stay up with the reading. I challenge you, early on, especially in freshman English, to conquer monkey mind. We've talked about this earlier, that challenge of conquering monkey mind. By following along with each word with the tip of our pencil or pen. Don't write in your book, right? The annotations you're taking are off the page. But try to stay up with the reader and follow along. At the conclusion of our reading, we will work with our three levels. Okay? All right, let's now pay attention and read along Isaac Singer's Washwoman. Just follow along and read. The Washwoman by Isaac Bashiva Singer. Our home had little contact with Gentiles. The only Gentile in the building was the janitor. Fridays, he would come for a tip, his Friday money. He remained standing at the door took off his hat, and my mother gave him six groschen. Besides the janitor, there were also the Gentile washwomen who came to the house to fetch our laundry. My story is about one of these. She was a small woman, old and wrinkled. When she started washing for us, she was already past 70. Most Jewish women of her age were sickly, weak, broken in body. All the old women in our street had bent backs and leaned on sticks when they walked. But this washwoman, small and thin as she was, possessed a strength that came from generations of peasant forebears. Mother would count out to her a bundle of laundry that had accumulated over several weeks. She would lift the unwieldy pack, load it on her narrow shoulders, and carry it the long way home. She lived on Krakmalna Street, too, but at the other end, near the Vola section. It must have been a walk of an hour and a half. She would bring the laundry back about two weeks later. My mother had never been so pleased with any washwoman. Every piece of linen sparkled like polished silver. Every piece was neatly ironed, yet she charged no more than the others. She was a real find. Mother always had her money ready because it was too far for the old woman to come a second time. Laundering was not easy in those days. The old woman had no faucet where she lived but had to bring in the water from a pump. For the linens to come out so clean, they had to be scrubbed thoroughly in a wash tub, rinsed with washing soda, soaked, boiled in an enormous pot, starched, then ironed. Every piece was handled ten times or more. And the drying, it could not be done outside because thieves would steal the laundry. The wrung out wash had to be carried up to the attic and hung on clotheslines. In the winter, it would become as brittle as glass and almost break when touched. And there was always a to-do with other housewives and washwomen who wanted the attic clothesline for their own use. Only God knows all the old woman had to endure each time she did a wash. She could have baked at the church door or entered a home for the penniless and aged. But there was in her a certain pride and love of labor with which many Gentiles have been blessed. The old woman did not want to become a burden, and so she bore her burden. My mother spoke a little Polish, and the old woman would talk with her about many things. 
She was especially fond of me and used to say I looked like Jesus. She repeated this every time she came and mother would frown and whisper to herself, her lips barely moving. May her words be scattered in the wilderness. The woman had a son who was rich. I no longer remember what sort of business he had. He was ashamed of his mother, the washwoman, and never came to see her, nor did he ever give her a groschen. The old woman told this without rancor. One day the son was married. It seemed that he had made a good match. The wedding took place in a church. The son had not invited the old mother to his wedding, but she went to the church and waited at the steps to see her son lead the young lady to the altar. The story of the faithless son left a deep impression on my mother. She talked about it for weeks and months. It was an affront not only to the old woman, but to the entire institution of motherhood. Mother would argue, no. Does it pay to make sacrifices for children? The mother uses up her last strength and he does not even know the meaning of loyalty. And she would drop dark hints to the effect that she was not certain of her own children. Who knows what they would do someday. This, however, did not prevent her from dedicating her life to us. If there was any delicacy in the house, she would put it aside for the children and invent all sorts of excuses and reasons why she herself did not want to taste it. She knew charms that went back to ancient times, and she used expressions she had inherited from generations of devoted mothers and grandmothers. If one of the children complained of a pain, she would say, May I be your ransom, and may you outlive my bones. Or she would say, May I be the atonement for the least of your fingernails. When we ate, she used to say, Health and marrow in your bones. The day before the new moon, she gave us a kind of candy that was said to prevent parasitic worms. If one of us had something in his eye, mother would lick the eye clean with her tongue. She also fed us rock candy against coughs. And from time to time, she would take us to be blessed against the evil eye. This did not prevent her from studying the duties of the heart, the Book of the Covenant, and other serious philosophic works. But to return to the watchwoman, that winter was a harsh one. The streets were in the grip of a bitter cold. No matter how much we heated our stove, the windows were covered with frost work and decorated with icicles. The newspapers reported that people were dying of the cold. Coal became dear. The winter had become so severe that parents stopped sending children to Cheder, and even the Polish schools were closed. On one such day, the washwoman, now nearly 80 years old, came to our house. A good deal of laundry had accumulated during the past weeks. Mother gave her a pot of tea to warm herself, as well as some bread. The old woman sat on a kitchen chair, trembling and shaking, and warmed her hands against the teapot. Her fingers were gnarled from work, and perhaps from arthritis, too. Her fingernails were strangely white. These hands spoke of the stubbornness of mankind, of the will to work not only as one's strength permits, but beyond the limits of one's power. Mother counted and wrote down the list. Men's undershirts, women's vests, long-legged drawers, bloomers, petticoats, shifts, feather bed covers, pillowcases, sheets, and the men's fringed garments. Yes, the Gentile woman washed these holy garments as well. The bundle was big, bigger than usual. When the woman placed it on her shoulders, it covered her completely. At first she swayed, as though she were about to fall under the load. 
but an inner obstinacy seemed to call out, no, you may not fall. A donkey may permit himself to fall under his burden, but not a human being, the crown of creation. It was fearful to watch the old woman staggering out with the enormous pack, out into the frost, where the snow was dry as salt, and the air was filled with dusty white whirlwinds, like goblins dancing in the cold. Would the old woman ever reach Vola? She disappeared, and Mother sighed and prayed for her. Usually, the woman brought back the wash after two or, at the most, three weeks. But three weeks passed, then four and five, and nothing was heard of the old woman. We remained without linens. The cold had become even more intense. The telephone wires were now as thick as ropes. The branches of the trees looked like glass. So much snow had fallen that the streets had become uneven, and sleds were able to glide down many streets as on the slopes of a hill. Kind-hearted people lit fires in the streets for vagrants to warm themselves and roast potatoes in, if they had any to roast. For us, the washwoman's absence was a catastrophe. We needed the laundry. We did not even know the woman's address. It seemed certain that she had collapsed, died. Mother declared she had had a premonition as the old woman left our house that last time that we would never see our things again. She found some old torn shirts and washed and mended them. We mourned both for the laundry and for the old toil-worn woman who had grown close to us through the years she had served us so faithfully. More than two months passed. The frost had subsided. And then a new frost had come, a new wave of cold. One evening, while Mother was sitting near the kerosene lamp mending a shirt, the door opened and a small puff of steam followed by a gigantic bundle entered. Under the bundle tottered the old woman her face as white as a linen sheet. A few wisps of white hair straggled out from beneath her shawl. Mother uttered a half-choked cry. It was as though a corpse had entered the room. I ran toward the old woman and helped her unload her pack. She was even thinner now, more bent. Her face had become more gaunt, and her head shook from side to side as though she were saying no. She could not utter a clear word, but mumbled something with her sunken mouth and pale lips. After the old woman had recovered somewhat, she told us that she had been ill, very ill. Just what her illness was, I cannot remember. She had been so sick that someone had called a doctor, and the doctor had sent for a priest. Someone had informed the son, and he had contributed money for a coffin and for the funeral. But the Almighty had not yet wanted to take this pain-wracked soul to himself. She began to feel better, she became well, and as soon as she was able to stand on her feet once more, she resumed her washing. Not just ours, but the wash of several other families too. I could not rest easy in my bed because of the wash the old woman explained. The wash would not let me die. With the help of God, you will live to be a hundred and twenty, said my mother, as a benediction. God forbid. What good would such a long life be? The work becomes harder and harder. My strength is leaving me. I do not want to be a burden on anyone. The old woman muttered and crossed herself and raised her eyes toward heaven. Fortunately, there was some money in the house, and Mother counted out what she owed. I had a strange feeling. The coins in the old woman's washed-out hands seemed to become as worn and clean and pious as she herself was. She blew on the coins 
and tied them in a kerchief. Then she left, promising to return in a few weeks for a new load of wash. But she never came back. The wash she had returned was her last effort on this earth. She had been driven by an indomitable will to return the property to its rightful owners, to fulfill the task she had undertaken. And now at last her body, which had long been no more than a shard supported only by the force of honesty and duty had fallen. Her soul passed into those spheres where all holy souls meet, regardless of the roles they played on this earth, in whatever tongue of whatever creed. I cannot imagine paradise without this Gentile washwoman. I cannot even conceive of a world where there is no recompense for such effort. All right, now let's turn to the story itself. Let's work level one quickly to get a sense of this, again, narrative essay. Singer is writing, of course, let's put this in our notes right away. Singer is, of course, writing as an adult, many years later, remembering back to a time in his youth where there was a story and he learned something from that story. So let's write this down at level 2B right away. Narrative essays do two things. We're going to have to write one of these, and that's why I'm pointing it out to you. One, they reflect back on a time from your own life when something important happened for you. Two, from the experience, however, you learn something. Okay? Now, we'll notice that in this text, this essay, Singer is going to tell us what he learned, but he's not going to say it necessarily in the form of a thesis. I learned X, 